Welcome to a Better Divorce Podcast, where we have conversations about the emotional, financial, and legal issues that are on your mind or should be on your radar if your goal is to keep your divorce out of court. I'm collaborative divorce attorney and mediator Andrea Vaca, and I know that how you divorce matters to your long term well being. That's why it's my mission to help you have a better divorce with as little acrimony as possible so that you can create the best life possible on the other side of your marriage. Hello, everyone. It's Andrea Vaca with Better Divorce Podcast, and I'm excited to do something a little different today on the podcast, and that's bring on some former, start to bring on some former clients onto the show to discuss their divorce journey. And we're going to find out what they learned during their divorce or since then that can help others have a better divorce. So I'm happy today to introduce you to my first guest slash former client, Mark Monchek. Mark is the founder and chief opportunity officer of Opportunity Lab, which is a strategy and facilitation consultancy that helps mission-driven organizations grow thriving and resilient businesses. And I'm really happy to have you here, Mark. Welcome. Thanks, Andrea. It's my pleasure and honor to be with you today. Yeah. So I um, recall seeing a post on LinkedIn um, maybe a year or more ago now when you acknowledged joy and gratitude for the way that you ended up divorcing and how it had led you and your ex-wife to be able to happily celebrate your daughter's wedding and her um, the birth of her child and becoming grandparents. And it was and it, it really moved me because that's exactly the type of outcome that I'm hoping that our clients can have after we help them. You know, if they have to end their marriages, we help them do that. And we want to help people reach agreements so that they can have the best possible relationship they can with their exes after the divorce is over. And that means divorcing in the least adversarial way possible for them. And my parents didn't do that. And the anger and resentment existed and lasted for years and impacted my sister's wedding and the birth of her daughter. So when I saw your post, it really, really moved me. So um, so I'm so glad to see that. And then I reached out to you sometime later after I had the part podcast to see if, be, if you'd be interested in, in sharing your journey here. And, um, and that's why we're here today. But I'd love to know what made you accept my invitation. Well, Andrea, first of all, thank you again for the invitation. And it, it's a really important opportunity to help people see that ending a marriage does not have to be tragic. It does not have to be wounding. It does not have to make you feel like you wish you were never married. Um, it can actually honor the relationship you had with your partner. It can actually allow you to have a better relationship with your partner in another way, possibly like I am with my um, former wife, who is an amazing grandparent, co-grandparent with me, with the two grandchildren we have. So I, you know, really look back at the experience and it was a very, very difficult one at first, but you helped make it easier. You helped me connect to my feelings, reflect on it, and then really see that it was, uh, important to do it in an intentional way. And I wanted to do it in a very different way than my parents did it. So my parents sounds like they had a similar painful experience as your family did. And I'm probably one of the few people whose parents after they divorced, never ever had them talk to each other ever for the rest of their lives. So my brother and I went through graduation from high school, graduation from college, getting our first jobs, getting married, uh, having children, starting businesses, um, ending marriages, at least for myself, and not once did they ever come together and say, whatever happened in our marriage, we love our children and we want to be able to be able to at least be with them in some way. And that never happened. That was probably the most traumatic thing in my growing up. And it's a thing that I absolutely did not want to happen to our child. And, and it didn't. So part of the reason that I worked with you and then subsequently you know, worked on myself afterwards was to be able to have our daughter have the best possible experience to say, hey, for her, the ending, of course, difficult, challenging, ended up to be a better relationship because we're now better parents, better grandparents. Right, right. 
Yeah, I don't know if I've ever heard of anyone never talking again. I that is one of that is very unusual, and I'm, it's very sad. But it allowed you to do your divorce differently, and I know that you wanted to do it differently. Um, well, we were talking before the podcast. You had mentioned that it's important. You know, you you think it's important to think about your divorce as as a positive as what was the positive outcome you know to the to the divorce and um and so you know why why do you think it's important to think about it as a positive outcome well Andrew, i want to start off by saying there's one thing that i rarely hear in any divorce proceedings or any divorce experience is they don't talk about what was good in the marriage because like like they, they end up talking about what is bad and what do you want what do you don't want like I had an amazingly beautiful, positive, enlightening, enriching experience with my former wife. And the vast majority of it was just incredibly um, wonderful and having a, a child together and now honoring our child and our grandchildren. So I think it's also important when you go through the divorce to realize, okay, you got married for a reason. And some of that reason was probably um, evolved in a way that you liked and some of it you did not like. So I think it's important to honor what was good in a relationship before you get into what didn't work and what you want to evolve out of. Right, right. And also to recognize that you might be having very different experiences around that, right? You and your um, spouse at the time when you're divorcing might think of it very differently. as to what was good and what was not so good and where you should be, but just keeping the focus on I guess, on what you can take out of it and what was good for you and not worry about what the other person's thinking at that time. Yes, uh, yes. And, and it, it's important to reaffirm that I'm giving you my experience and this is just my personal experience and I'm not saying it should be uh, her experience or anybody else's or my daughter's experience uh, with it. It's just, you know, what, what I have felt. Yeah. So going back to your early question, why is it important to have a positive divorce experience because I, I look at a divorce i would i would prefer the word if we could change the word divorce to marital conclusion or relationship conclusion because divorce you know when i was growing up divorce had this such a uh, weight to it such a traumatic if you were a failure if you divorced you know back in those days divorce wasn't very common and i didn't know very many people many many children who had uh, parents who were divorcing. And then suddenly after that, it seemed like it was a, the floodgates opened in the 70s when divorce became, I wouldn't say popular, but became more acceptable. And then there was all of these marriages that were so troubled that suddenly when the permission happened to get a divorce, they, the, the, I think the divorce attorneys must have been flooded with, eh, we hardly ever see anything. And now it's just <laughs> common. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think the the ending is important because to me, the relationship was sacred. The beginning should be sacred. You know, the middle should be sacred and the ending should be sacred because it was important to get married in the first place. So it's important to do it in a way that was honoring the relationship and trying to be fair and, and caring about both sides was, was my attempt. Right. So given your parents, um, terrible, you know, very, difficult, horrible divorce, obviously. Um, you know, what did it mean to you to get divorced? Like when you had, when that decision was made, um, what was the meaning that was coming up for you? I mean, trying to put things in perspective was one thing, but you know, what, yeah, that's my question. What, what did it mean given where you had come from, you know, your own relationship? Well, let me, let me say first, what got me to the point where I was ready to make that decision? Cause that's, okay. that's important. So given what I just shared with you about my parents' divorce, but also their marriage was, you know, it, it wasn't just the divorce that was difficult. It was many, many years in the marriage that was difficult to the point where my brother and I used to get very, very worried when we didn't hear our parents fighting. We thought uh, something must be terribly wrong. <laughs> it was like a day that they weren't arguing. We thought that was that was an unusual day. Yeah. You know, so. Um, I wanted to make sure that I had done everything I could possibly do to be the best husband and that that the, the reason why we were separating and divorcing was not because I could have done something different. So I um, you know, went 
into therapy several times, you know, really did a lot of self-reflection, uh, tried, we, we did try um, marital counseling several times. So I, I felt like I wanted to make sure if there was anything I could do to improve my ability to be in the relationship, that I wanted to exhaust that first before I came and made a decision. So when I made the decision, I felt like, yeah, I really had done everything I could possibly do. And I wouldn't later have a regret to say, I wished I would have worked more on that personality trait or were, would have been better communicating in this particular way. Right. You really knew this was what needed to happen because there was nothing else you could do. So you, so the meaning, like you knew you did everything you could. So that, that must've made you feel like a little better that not that you wanted to end your marriage, but that this was the next step for the relationship. Yeah, it was a five-year process uh, for me of sharing what I wanted, what I wasn't getting, what I tried to get, and, and trying to work it through within myself and within the relationship. So when I did finally make the decision, I didn't have regrets about it. I didn't have doubts about it. It was difficult, uh, but the difficult part wasn't continually wondering if I shouldn't have done this. It was really, okay, this is what I need to do. I thought it through. Now, how do I do it in the best possible way? So that that decision making journey took about five years, you said. And I recall we worked together for about five years, approximately. It took a long time. It was, um, you know, I, I don't maybe it was a little less than that, but it was a long time. So and so what do you think, looking back on it all, you know, made it made the once you made the decision and let your former wife know that you wanted to divorce why do you think our process took the time it did looking back uh you know that's a good question i would say i had not yet worked out my guilt about um so I had a I had a pretty significant depression several years before uh, I we ended up getting separated and divorced, and I really felt guilty about the burden it put on my former wife and my daughter, and I wanted to make sure that in the actual divorce I was being uh, as fair financially and as fair emotionally as I possibly could. So when my former wife would say something that came out of her hurt or out of her anger, I would get triggered by it. And I think that was one of the reasons. And the other reason was from her side, it just it took her a long time to get comfortable with it. Yeah. And I didn't feel pressuring her or trying to coerce her was working. And during that period of time, so you and I, I think, worked together for a couple of years, but the actual divorce probably took about almost seven years, which felt like a long time. But I didn't stop my life. I didn't, you know, I wasn't like I was in limbo. I was, you know, I was moving forward. I was actually having the life I wanted to. And I wanted to make sure it was collaborative and it took that long. So could it have been less maybe? Uh, but the result was, I think, very positive from my end. And I think uh, the best I know from our daughter's end, it was... Um, you know, it, it was caring. And so um, that's that's my best response yeah. to that question. So, yeah. So you definitely kept your daughter out of it. Um, and just um, for anyone listening or watching, um, we were never in court. You know, this was an you were negotiating an agreement with her or trying to get her to come to. Accept the fact that this marriage was ending and how can we start talking about the terms? There was a lot of waiting. You were very patient. Um, but I also recall there was a lot of guilt involved. And I think that's why you weren't pushing harder to get things done. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how guilt might have played a part or or not what the guilt was based on, if you don't want to share that, but you know how it impacted the what looked like patience and <laughs> just kind of waiting for her to come come along? anything you recall about that i th i think whether it's whether it's guilt or whether it's any emotional block that happens for for me or anybody else when that guilt gets triggered right or that anger or that sadness or that fear whatever the kind of 
core emotion is that gets triggered. It it didn't allow me to have a conscious, caring conversation. So, right. So my decision was if I'm not going to be able to have a conscious, caring conversation and have a dialogue when my partner is very upset and very emotional, then I prefer not to have any dialogue. Um, as I got to the point where I was less triggered and more able to have a caring, conscious dialogue, and she was able to get to an acceptance, then it just became easier. And then it became what it was, which was, you know, the ending. Yeah. yeah. So for others that are um, contemplating divorce or in the middle of the process and feeling strong emotions, such as guilt, anger, resentment, you know, something that's stopping them from moving forward or at, uh, they're trying to push more than they should, you know, what, any advice for somebody negotiating from guilt or any other strong emotion that, from what you've learned? The first advice is not to make it about the other person, right? And this is, I think this is the most important dynamic that I see that goes wrong, not just in divorces, but in all kinds of conflicts is the person, let's say in my case, uh, it's very easy to make it about the other person. The other person is being unfair. The other person is being impossible. The other person is this. And and that might be, there might be some truth to that in some situations. It's very possible the other person is acting in a, in a way that might make it very difficult for anybody to have a collaborative conscious conversation. I learned that I had to say, all right, well, if this is triggering me, then there's something that caused that trigger in the first place. And it happened way before I was ever even married. So I think the advice is go back into time, go back into yourself and realize what is the actual beginning of that trigger. So if it's, you know, if it's fear, if it's shame, if it's guilt, you know, anger, whatever, when did you first have that experience in a way that troubled you and, and, and unsettled you and made you not be your best self? Mm -hmm. So that was, um, you know, the, the journey I had to take inward. And then as I kind of relieved the, the earlier cause of those strong emotions, the interaction became much easier. And then I was able to speak from a responsive way rather than an, in a reactive way. Right. How did you do that exactly? Were you in therapy, in individual therapy during your divorce? Or were you able to do this reflective work on your own? Or, you know, how, how did you get there? Yeah, so I definitely was, there was, there were definitely some periods of individual therapy and all, all the, the therapy counseling that I've done over the years, and I was a therapist for 20 years myself, was the, the actual work happens mostly outside of the session. So the session itself is there to uncover, to explore, to get support, to get insight. But then there's the, you know, the, the work that happens, whether that's journaling or meditation, you know, or going deeper inside and experiencing, re-experiencing, you know, whatever that was, the original trauma was. So, yeah, that's been my my life journey, you know, growing up with two parents who each of them had a lot of intergenerational trauma. So my mother uh, was a Holocaust survivor. My father grew up in 500 square foot apartment with nine people, Jewish immigrant family, wanted to be a doctor, had a dream to escape the, you know, the, the ghetto of Brownsville, Brooklyn back in the early 1900s. Uh, wasn't able to go to medical school because there was a Jewish quota back then, had to go and take his medical education in Germany, in Austria. When Hitler invaded Austria, my father had to flee to Switzerland, got his degree there, came back. So, you know, I had a lot of intergenerational trauma from both of my parents, and that was kind of part of what made their relationship so difficult. Neither one of them had the ability or the resources to heal that. So when I was going inside of myself, I was able to be aware of that that trauma that I had was not just from my parents, but from their parents and their parents and from societal factors that went back many generations. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy to, to just look at the other person and think what, you know, what they're doing wrong or what they did. Um, and it's, it's hard um, from my point of view as the attorney to say, well, you know, how did, you know, how did you, what, what could you do differently? I have to say it sometimes. And of course, I encourage my clients to work with therapists or coaches and do what they can to get the advice that they need, the support they need to go deeper. 
you know, there's only so much I can do, but I, I know it needs to be done sometimes. So if anyone I'm listening, if your attorney suggests you talk to a therapist or a coach, um, it's really so that you can you can move forward. Um, so take that advice. Um, look at where where are these feelings are coming from. Um, so you um, you know you were married for a long time. Um, was it twenty five or thirty? How long were you married by the time you thirty seven years? It was thirty seven by the end time mm -hmm. you got divorced. Okay. Um, Looking back now for the divorce, I, I, for anyone talking about a long-term marriage or, or a shorter-term marriage, you know, is there anything you would have done differently um, in the divorce process itself or how you would went about it? Well, like I said earlier, I, I wish that I could have been less triggered and more responsive and maybe it would have been faster. But I, I don't really have a lot of regret about that because, like I said, it turned out to be, for me anyway, um, healing and it feel like it it's put us in a really loving place as grandparents as parents um so yeah i mean you, you could say a lot of things in your life would, would would be different but if you allow yourself to say i did the best i could with the resources that i have and at every stage when i had more resources and more insight i was able to do better and so what advice do you have for others um other than looking at themselves, uh, looking back, perhaps, as to where what's causing their pain. What about future, like trying to imagine that future or um, the life that they want to live? You know, any anything that you can offer there uh, to help them get through this difficult time? But I think that kind of advice, Andrea, goes back to way before you even get married, because I think a lot of us get married to unconsciously heal a wound that was never healed to get something from the other person we are not able to get from ourselves or we didn't get from our early childhood from our parents or our communities or what have you so i think the the advice goes what are you expecting from a marriage from a relationship and make sure your expectations are realistic and you're not trying to get the other person to do something that you have to do yourself so the other person can love you the other person can't make you feel loved the other person can empathize with you, but the other person can't give you the empathy that you need to give yourself, right? The other person can compliment you. The other person can't make you whole as a, as a human being. Right. So I think it goes back to being very aware of why you're getting married, what you expect from the marriage, what you expect from yourself and the, your partner, and not having expectations that the other person cannot fulfill. Yeah, a lot of, I, you see a lot of, you know, like someone can bring you joy. Your relationship can bring you joy, but they can't make you happy. No one can make you happy, yeah. right? You have to be mm -hmm. happy yourself. Yeah. And so when I'm working with clients and, um, you know, I'm, I'm always asking them also to look forward as to what l life might look like on the other side of the marriage. You know, where do they want to be? That not only helps them figure out how much money do they need and what kind of assets they need to keep, but what, what do they... What does life look like? You know, how can we create that vision? Do you recall having that, you know, when and and how you had a vision for what life would look like after your divorce and how that might have pulled you forward instead of the bad marriage pushing you forward? You know, maybe it's a vision that pulled you forward. Did anything like that come up for you? Yeah, so I'll give you the the dark side and the light side. So the dark side was, and this may be one reason why it uh, took me longer than I wished it would have, is I imagined, you know, after uh, the separation, I am a single, lonely man living in a shabby, dark, you know, apartment, <laughs> you know, like poor, you know, without uh, any, you know, light and happiness. And I, you know, that was like, I think that came from when when my mother left my father my father was literally devastated now he when he when he lived as a medical student in europe he was very independent he lived for many years by himself traveled back to the united states by himself but i gotta tell you andrew when he when my mother left my father somehow couldn't boil water like he he couldn't boil water to put a hard boiled egg in the water. <laughs> so I was like, I was 15 years old and I felt like I had to stay with him just to keep, make sure that he didn't go into like a dark place where he couldn't get up in the morning. 
So I think my initial thought about divorce came from his reaction, how terrified he was about being alone. And I think that's, you know, our, our abandonment fears, which often come from early childhood, or even before, you know, even in the, in the womb experience, I think shapes how we think about uh, what happens after the divorce. So that's, so the, the healing, the dark side is one element. And then the light side was I started to realize, hey, I actually can do all these things by myself. I can shop, I can cook, I can uh, travel. And there's a certain amount of freedom you get. Well, hey, I don't have to worry about whether somebody wants or not wants me to do this. And I don't have to worry about somebody's mood in the morning or, you know, there's a freedom that you have and you say, okay, I can kind of do the day the way I want to do it. And, you know, I was able to kind of think about, all right, well, now that I am on my own, what does that actually look like? And and what do I, you, you start to make choices for yourself where in, in the past you were making choices that were often a negotiation. Okay, well, what does my wife want? What uh, what do we want? What does my daughter want? You know, there was a whole series of, of assessments that you made. And then when you're by yourself, you got, okay, just me. <laughs> I, I got to try to please myself this day. Right. Yeah. The freedom there. <laughs> I get, you could just feel sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll see, um, I'll run into clients sometimes on the street or somewhere and I hadn't seen them in a couple of years since their divorce. And I almost don't recognize them sometimes because they they look, they're like, you like there's this like they look more beautiful they look or handsome or whatever, whatever it might be they just look lighter they look different because mm -hmm. when i'm working with them there's there's so much heaviness and weight and mm -hmm. fear and sadness and and we're trying to move them forward to this more positive place um but i always love seeing them and how different they look because you know and you're you're one of those examples mm -hmm. just you know just looking lighter because life is lighter and they have less mm -hmm burdens you know um so uh yeah uh, that's always I, I i see it as well as you know i know mm -hmm. you're feeling yeah. it um all right so i i'm really happy we had this opportunity to talk and um is there anything else you'd want to say before i ask you for our, your better divorce tip um is there anything else uh you know we we didn't cover here that you wanted to add i'll just say on my on the days that are difficult and the days there are have been some very difficult days, you know, since the the Israeli war and the Ukrainian, the Ukraine Russia war, I try to think about, all right, well, let's what am I grateful for? And I, I when I really go deeper into the gratitude, I realize just whatever else is happening that I don't want to happen. There is so much to be grateful for. And I try to ground myself in gratitude. And maybe that's the better divorce tip is. If you stay in gratitude, um, despite the fact that there are things that you wish were not happening, that is very grounding to me. So when I look at people, I think Viktor Frankl is one of the people I admire. You know, he lived in a concentration camp. Uh, he lost his wife, his parents. Um, he, I think he lost everybody in his family. And he made a decision that he could only control one thing. And that's how he felt. And that's my better divorce tip is yes. that's the one thing you can control. I'm not saying it's easy to do, no. um, but when I realized that, that we've given that ability to be able to choose how we feel and how we act, try to step into that as much as yeah. I can. That's that's where that's the only thing we control is what how we think, how we react, what we do. And I heard something about that, Viktor Frankl, just this week, that um, there was a, some, a certain tree. And he was there for a few years in that concentration camp. And there's this one tree and he would focus on it every day, how beautiful it was through all the seasons. And um, he, he noticed beauty to, you know, so it was gratitude and, and seeing this what this particular tree was one of those things that made him feel more grateful. And I also, I personally did a meditation this week where um, it was uh, to focus on uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And um, to be, you know, start, you know, be grateful, a gratitude meditation based on that for the air and the water, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> up to being able to be self-actualized um, and all the things in between your clothes, your shelter. And it was such a, a lovely way to look at, you know, the hierarchy of needs and be grateful for mm -hmm. everything that you do have that yeah. you need. So, 
Um, so thank you so much, Mark. I'm, I'm glad we we had you here. Um, so I know, um, you know, the work you do is not necessarily related to divorce, but if anyone wanted to find out more about you, how could people uh, find you? Well, our mission of our company, Opportunity Lab, is to support sustainable business growth by expanding consciousness. So we believe that businesses have a responsibility to create a better world and that we want to support those businesses who want to create a better world through really, really, truly loving, supporting customers, employees, associates, investors, and particularly the communities that we do business in. So you can find uh, us at oplab.com, O-P-P-L-A-B.com. Uh, I have a monthly podcast uh, on the, the other side of potential with my friend and co-host Ka- uh, Sharon Spanow. You can find that uh, at Op- Apple Podcasts or anywhere you get your podcasts and also on our website. And I have a book, uh, Culture of Opportunity, How to Grow Your Business in an Age of Disruption, which is on Amazon. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And um, for anyone else looking to find out more about our law firm, uh, Vaca Family Law Group, you can find us at vacalaw.com. This has been another episode of Better Divorce Podcast. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll see everyone on the next episode. You're welcome. Thank you, Andrea. You've been tuning in to another episode of a Better Divorce Podcast with Andrea Vaca. Thank you for subscribing, leaving your positive comments and reviews, and sharing the show with others. You can watch episodes at VacaLaw.com, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And you can listen through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Bye for now. And remember, you can have a better divorce.